These two ultra small router, firewall, and virtualization hosts are absolutely awesome. One of them has eight two and a half gig ethernet ports, but the other has four two and a half gig and two 10 gigabit ethernet ports. They also support four core eight thread 10th gen Intel core processors, and they're super quiet. So let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from SDH, and today we're gonna take a look at these two little systems. These are super awesome, and we've been running them for a while now with PFSense, OPN Sense, and also Proxmox VE but I've received a ton of messages asking if we could take a look at these because some folks just want more ethernet ports than the traditional like fanless units have. And then some other folks just want 10 gig ethernet. Like every single time we do one of these little fanless firewall ones, we always get comments and somebody says, well, Patrick, I wish it had SFP plus. Well, this one actually does. And you still have your four two and a half gig ethernet ports. And the CPUs in these are actually pretty good, but there is some weird stuff to these too. For example, these are based on NAS motherboards with six SATA ports on board. Depending on the configuration, these range from a little over $300 to a little over $500. Now that makes these units more expensive than these fanless firewall units. But on the other hand, you're getting way more networking. And I just wanna say a quick thank you to the STH YouTube members. You guys requested that we look at this and your support helps us go and buy these units so we can do independent reviews. If you do wanna help us out, you can always join down below. Any help is always appreciated. But hey, with that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, so looking at the hardware, these things are super simple, but they have a really unique feature. The first thing you're gonna notice is that the array of ports on these is actually a little better than you would expect when we're not even talking about the networking side. The reason for that is that we have a audio jack, then we have our power button, and then we start to get into our main ports. We have an HDMI port, a display port, and then we have four USB type A ports. Something to keep in mind that in these two units, we have the Core i5 and Core i7, which are 10th gen U-series processors built in, and those are pretty capable processors. Now, while these don't have crazy amounts of I.O., if you really wanted to, you could run these things as a desktop. I think these actually would make a pretty interesting little Ubuntu desktop if you wanted to have like a ton of networking and not so many like USB ports, but still you could do it. Something that you might see, because a lot of the views are like this or something like that. And so, you know, you have a lot of folks that might say like, oh, you know, this is going to be like a fanless unit, but there actually is a fan. Hopefully you guys can see this here, but there's a fan in these units. And that's just something to keep in mind that these are not passively cooled, although it does use the chassis to cool the CPU. We'll show you how that works when we get inside. And just real quick, both units on the bottom of these had nice little rubber feet. So at least they're not gonna go and wreck up your table like if you have them here. Now, of course, let's get to the side that everybody wants to see, which is the networking side. On this one over here, we get a total of eight two and a half gig ethernet ports. These are all Intel i226V, so Intel's newest network controller on the two and a half gig side. Now on the other unit, we get instead of the second row of four two and a half gig ethernet ports, we get two 10 gig gig SFP plus cages, but you'll see on both of the units that the top four two and a half gig ethernet ports are common. We're gonna show you this when we get inside, but those are directly attached to the motherboard, whereas the expansion or customization module, that's what's giving us the bottom set of ports. Two other quick features on the back of this is that we get a standard DC 12 volt input. I like the fact that it's just a standard barrel jack. It's not like some kind of like crazy exotic thing. It also has a serial console port on the back, which a lot of folks, when they build firewalls, they wanna have those so that way they have some way to get into them. And I just wanna do like a quick size comparison to some of these fanless units that we have. You're gonna see that uh, they're, they're actually about the same size. I mean, you, you could say that the fanless one is definitely a little bit bigger, fine. But the one thing that I will point out though, is that one, you know, of course this one has a fan, but two, you're gonna see that the ports are on opposite ends. So whereas this is just kind of like fins and stuff on the fanless one, you'll see that we actually have the ports on the end. So it's a different orientation. With that, let's get inside the system. Okay, now getting inside the system is pretty darn easy. There are four screws on each side, plus an additional two on this side. And you know, there's just a little bit of disassembly required because there are multiple PCBs in this, which is a little bit different than the fanless units that we've seen. And so the first thing I wanna talk about is just the cooling of the CPU. So when we pulled this apart, we found that the CPU has this like, kind of like little small low profile cooler on it that also has a copper bit. And that copper bit has some thermal paste not really a great application of the thermal paste if we're being honest, but it goes to the top of the chassis. So it seems like what Topton is doing here is they have kind of like the main CPU heatsink, plus they're using the chassis to cool that as well. 
And even though these are very quiet fans, it does mean that these are a different class of systems than the fanless units because, well, there's a fan in here. And so the CPU is on the top side of this motherboard. And the two CPUs that we got, I thought were gonna be very different, um, but, but that was totally wrong. We got both the Core i7, and I think it's like a 10510U, and then we also got the Core i5, which is a 10210U. And they're both relatively low power processors, but they ended up being a lot closer in performance than you might expect if you were thinking like Core i5 to Core i7 jump. Okay, now when we flip to the other side of this, you're going to see something that is uh, is really interesting in terms of motherboard. So let's just kind of look around real quick. First off, you're going to see that the top of the motherboard has two DDR4 SO DIMM slots. In both of these, we got them configured with 16 gigabytes of memory. So we got our fancy U-Tiger 16 gigabyte DDR4 SO DIMM. Now, the big thing to remember here is that realistically, the memory speed that we were getting on these units was DDR4 2666. So even if you put like DDR4 3200, you're not going to get faster memory speed and you kind of don't even need it. The one thing though that is interesting on both these units is that you only get single channel memory if you get the 16 gig configuration. Now that single dim means that you're only getting single channel memory but on the flip side let's remember that these don't have really great airflow and so I think that the reason that they only have like one dim in each of these is really because the top 10 folks or CW folks were thinking like hey how do we lower the overall power consumption and heat generated in the system. Now below the memory, you're gonna see that we get a single M.2 slot and this has our S500 Pro SSD. We only got 256 gig modules because we were like, well, maybe we can add a second one, but then we couldn't. So if you do want an SSD, I would probably get a bigger one, but on the other hand, like one terabyte DRAM-less, like cashless SSDs, they are, tend to be like really inexpensive these days and tend, tend to be like low power. So I would totally look for one of those. But then things get kind of crazy because here in the middle of the motherboard, we have six completely unused used SATA ports. There are also two Molex connectors. So what I think this is, if you see the CW NAS model number on the motherboard, I think that this is designed to actually be a NAS motherboard that then was like kind of co-opted into like, hey, why don't we go turn this into a networking box? But I do think that this could be a really cool NAS platform if it was just in a different chassis because you can't really use the SATA ports. And if you have those like Molex to like SATA power things, you can't really use them here because there's just no, nowhere to put a drive, let alone six of them. And another reason that this motherboard is completely crazy isn't just because it has six unused SATA ports, but this is also a router firewall that, you know, has like display outputs, has USB, audio, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like a NAS motherboard that could be used as a PC, it could be used as a NAS, or in this particular one, you have like kind of maybe either a PC or a firewall router virtualization host. Now, the PCIe slot in these systems is the big feature because unlike a lot of the fanless systems that we've seen that use M.2 like kind of slots for PCIe lanes, this actually has a real PCIe slot. And what CW does is they take a PCIe by four riser, they put it into that slot and that gives them a, I guess, kind of a, a different angle of a PCIe slot. Now, of course, in that slot, they are not using just a standard off the shelf NIC in either case for the 10 gig or for the four two and a half gig. Instead, we get something that is completely custom. On the two and a half gig ethernet side, we get four I226V controllers, but then we get an AS Media PCIe switch in the middle. So that way you can take four by one devices and plug them into a, you know, by four slot. Now on the 10 gig side, we get something completely different than we were expecting. There is a Intel X520 NIC, which is dual SFP plus that is custom made for this application. Now, something to keep in mind on the Intel X520 is that that is a widely supported NIC. So if you're running things like PFSense, OPNSense, if you're running Ubuntu, if you're running Proxmox, any of those types of things, they will have a built-in driver because it's the IXGB driver and that's been around for forever. I mean, it's like a very well-supported NIC, except for one major case. And that is VMware ESXi 8. VMware ESXi 8 does not support the X520 out of the box. Instead, you have to go back to ESXi 7. On the other hand though, the Intel X520 is a dual SFP NIC, but it's not the lowest power one or the like best featured one that Intel has. Things like the Intel X540, 550, also the Intel X710, for example, those are all NICs that have, I guess, more features and that I think a lot of folks might wanna use, but 
on the other hand, I can see why we have the X520 here because it's just it's just less expensive. And the CPU on here is fast enough that you could like do 10 gig NAT and stuff like that. But on the other hand, if you wanna put like a lot of firewall rules, this, this CPU just doesn't have enough power to go do that. Hey, with that, that sounds like we're getting to performance. So let's get to that section next. Okay, so when we did the configuration of these, remember we got the Core i5 with the eight two and a half gig one, and we also got the Core i7 with the dual 10 gig one. And you might think that the Core i5 to Core i7 would be a enormous jump or something like that. But when we ran things like Geekbench or some of our other benchmarks, that wasn't really the case. Instead, the performance was a lot closer than you would think. So I would say that the Core i5 is a $20 upgrade. And if you're building maybe a high-end version of one of these, then okay, I can definitely see that. But on the other hand, I actually think that the Core i5, if I were gonna recommend to everybody like what to get, I would get the Core i5. And the reason for that is because if these are designed as network devices, I actually think that the Core i5 is in many ways a better network device. When you look at these two systems side by side and we just kind of ran them side by side using the stress test, you'll see that the Core i7 actually fought to go from like three gigahertz up to you know 3.2 gigahertz more often than we saw on the Core i5 unit. That was still running at around three gigahertz and stuff, but it was a lot more consistent. You're not seeing the same clock speed jumps that you saw on the Core i7. And since they end up being power and cooling limited anyway, I actually think that the Core i5 is probably the better one. I would save $20 there. Now, of course, if you're using this as a desktop or there's some other type of thing that you need where you need maximum performance, of course, get the Core i7. But I think for most users, the Core i5 is probably the sweet spot. And before we move on real quick, I just wanna point out that if you're looking at these compared to some of the fanless units, you would compare these directly to something like an Intel N200 or something like that. The Intel N305 is all E cores, but it is also eight cores and newer generation. So it is much faster than these four core eight thread units are. And if you wanna learn more about the N100, N200 or N305, we'll have links to those videos in the description. With that, let's get to power. Okay, let's talk about the power consumption real quick and noise. And let's talk about that noise one first. So this is the Core i7 model and it's on right now and I'm actually running a 100% workload and uh, I'm just gonna let you hear this real quick. But if you, uh, if you just listen in, in our 34 DBA studio, I can barely hear it and it's not even an arm's length away. Okay, so let's talk about power consumption real quick. And we are using, by the way, the included replacement AC adapter. Now these things tend to be absolutely terrible and usually changing out for a different 12 volt unit will reduce your power consumption by a couple watts. With that said, however, let's talk about the idle power consumption. So the Core i7 unit, you might think, well, it has a Core i7 and it has 10 gigabit ethernet. So of course that's gonna be the higher power one but it's actually not. We get somewhere in the 12 to maybe 13, 14 watt range for idle power in Proxmox VE. And then when we get to full 100% load, like it's actually running right now, we're only at about 39-ish watts. Now, if we compare that to the Core i5 8 two and a half gig model, we actually get higher power consumption. The idle power consumption is somewhere in the 14 to 16 watt range. And we're gonna see about 41 watts plus or minus a couple in the top end. And you might be wondering, these both have 15 watt TDP CPUs. So why is the power consumption so different? And I can tell you the easy reason is because the two and a half gig ethernet, especially the second one, uses a PCIe switch plus the extra two and a half gig ethernet NICs. Now the Intel i226Vs are lower power than the Intel i224 five Vs. However, you still have four more of them. And so when you're talking about a maximum of like 41 watts or so, the extra, you know, two watts or whatever of adding those actually adds up. And since we saw that the package power was pretty much the same, I think that the difference between them is really in the NIC. You might notice that we only have one two and a half gig ethernet port running on both of these, but that's really just to kind of equalize them and kind of show them like, like the best that we can. The thing that's gonna change, of course, is when you plug in the two and a half gig ethernet NICs, they're gonna use different amounts of power based on how long the cable lengths are. And then also the 10 gigabit uh, SFP plus cages, those are gonna be vastly different if you use something like a DAC versus a short range optic, long range optic, or you use a 10 G base T adapter. So you might be able to add say like another five to seven watts in power consumption on this one, just based on adding up all the NICs. So the top end, you might get this one up to like maybe 46, 47 watts if you had all the NICs active. And that brings us to our key lessons learned. 
Okay, now with all these reviews, I'd love to have some key lessons learned. Like, what do we learn from this? I think, you know, the obvious one is, of course, that the Core i5 and Core i7 are much closer than they might look just by the naming and branding and stuff like that. I actually think that the Core i5 is the one I would purchase. But the bigger one to me is the fact that we ran these systems and I expected them to fail. Like, I 100% thought, like, if we ran these things hard for a month, they would fail. And so we ran the Core i7 one, we literally ran StressNG on it for a month and it just didn't die. We did some other workloads with this one and that's kind of how we split it up. But, you know, I was totally expecting that this thing would just like overheat and, and reboot and like that would be it. The other thing I was expecting with both of these units is that they would go and you'd like throttle them up to 100% CPU utilization and then you'd see that their power would throttle. And for whatever reason, these were not configured to do that out of the box. And the temperatures definitely got high. We were into the like mid 70s Celsius. But on the other hand, um, they just kind of kept running, which I guess is probably due to the fact that they have a fan, even though it's not a great fan. And they also have this kind of like chassis cooling as well. But as crazy it is to have a NAS motherboard with all of this networking being used as a firewall router or virtualization appliance, that, that's not even the craziest part of it because most of the workloads that we ran, ran absolutely fine. And we ran them for a long time and, and under stress and they worked fine except for one thing, and that's Geekbench 6. Geekbench 6, when it got to the multi-threaded one, either Geekbench 6 or 6.1, we saw the exact same behavior where we just kind of quit and reboot the machine. Geekbench 5 ran perfectly fine. You could loop it and it wouldn't have any issues. You could literally run StressNG, no issues on this thing. But once you ran Geekbench 6, somewhere in that like kind of first half of the multi-threaded test, it would just reboot. And I thought it was just the Core i5 one because that was the one that we were running on it initially. And then we got done testing like kind of our long-term stress and G test on the Core i7, ran Geekbench 6 on there, and it did the exact same thing. And I guess that's kind of the bummer, right? Like these things are always on that like kind of edge of like, are they good? Are they bad? Because um, for some people, you know, they love all of these things. I mean, I literally know ISPs that are using the fanless ones in Europe because they save so much power and they're so much lower cost than other alternatives like Protectly and stuff. On the other hand, you then run into things like where Geekbench resets the system. And I, I just don't understand why. The other thing though, is that I think that when these things are running at their maximum, they use too much power. The N305 was really not using as much power as these and it's a way faster chip. It's just a little bit more modern. But again, part of that is also just due to the fact that we have more NICs on both of these than we have on the N305 unit. So I, I guess maybe that might be contributing a bit, but I would have liked to see just like something that said, okay, hey, these CPUs are only gonna run at like, you know, maximum like 2.8 gigahertz and they're just gonna like all core if you ran them 100%, that's what they would run at. I actually think they'd be better products running at that than trying to boost up higher. And my final key lesson learned is really, even though that this thing stayed up for 30 days without failing, I would have preferred if there was some way to have like two 40 millimeter fans or something like that just blowing through the chassis. I mean, we already have a fan on the top of the system, so you can't say that this is a fanless system, even though this is very quiet. On the other hand, I just would feel a lot better cooling those SFP cages, especially if you got like a higher power laser or something like that, or, or like some kind of module. I would just feel a lot better if you had like actual airflow through the chassis. I think that would just, just make me way happier. And it would also do things like keep the RAM cooler, keep the SSD cooler. With that guys, I hope you like this look at a crazy NAS motherboard that was turned into pretty awesome network appliances. They're definitely not the things that you would think of like, hey, we're gonna have in 2023, a brand new, you know, Intel i226V based 10th gen core motherboard, but that's, I guess, where we are today. And uh, if you want more network ports, or if you just wanna have 10 gig ports in addition to your four two and a half gig ethernet ports, this is a pretty interesting option. I think a lot of people are gonna be happy with this. And hey, if you like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching, have an awesome day.